But of course. Yeah. Why not? Right. Um, but they invited me. So uh, I wanted to put together a presentation that would put into the world the importance of Del Arte's co-founder, Carlo Antonio Clementi, to the American, the North American theater, to education in this country, to actor education, to the movements known as New Vaudeville, to circus, all of that. It's a bit of an untold story. I'm not the only one right now trying to tell it. Um, John Acorn, who's here today, is producing a film on it, and I'm going to show you a clip of that in the course of this. So if this was put together for that, I had to kind of retool it for this. It very much emphasizes um, Carlo's relationship to the Italian Commedia and um, the work of Del Arte International here in Blue Lake, our, um, our explorations of Commedia as opposed to the general theatrical stuff and the pedagogy and all that here. For the sake of, of making a point so, at the end of that, I think uh, because there's bits of video embedded in here, at the end of that, the floor will be open for people to give perspectives on Carlo. And there are several, five, six, seven, eight people in this room who knew him, some intimately. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> seeds. 
No roots, no fruits. <laughs> Author John Townsend wrote that Carlos single-handedly brought you to sawdust, right? Comedian to the United States starting in 1958. So let's talk about the Padova. Carlo Alessandro Luigi Mazzoni Clemente was born on December 12, 1920 in Padova. In the shadow of Galileo's tower, across the street from the 16th century birthplace of Angelo Bialco, Padova's great actor dramatist who wrote in peasant dialect under the name Il Santo. Carlo died 80 years later in his adopted home in Northern California, having sowed the seeds of Commedia dell'arte from coast to coast, <coughs> ignited a movement that has become known as New Vaudeville, established a company, a la Copo, and the Copio Cans, and began the first training center in North America dedicated to the work of the actor creator. Yet, <laughs> it would be misleading to say that Carlo's approach to life, to art, to comedia, was in any way orderly or well planned. <laughs> <laughs> His life was full of accidents, surprises, contradictions, and improviso. His teaching was never academic, never formulaic, and above all, he valued spontaneity as befits his larger than life, in the moment personality, <laughs> and the spirit of comedia inside him. From his arrival on the east coast of the United States in its biggest of cities, to his settling on the west coast in one of its smallest, a town of 1,250 people, behind the redwood curtain of Northern California, he was thought by some to be a genius and by others to be a madman. What others call my retreat, I call my advance. Growing up in Padua, Carlo heard many tales from his grandfather, Girolamo Clemente, who spoke Lucentino about the endearing customs of the hill folk immortalized by the nobleman playwright. Carlo's father was Neapolitan, his mother Padua. I digress from my text just to tell you now there's some magic tool in here which I don't know how to use. It's called a pen. Can you see my, yes, there it is. <gasps> oh, but I can't find it from here. Wait a minute. I just want to show you something. Yeah. Oops, that's not it. Wait a minute. Pen. Here. Watch this. Now, can you see sure. the little mole uh -huh. on the cheek? Uh -huh. Carla would say when he showed me this picture, this was the first map. <laughs> <laughs> Learn to project through the mask. So, uh, his grandfather was incredibly significant, as was his father. Um, Carlo's father was Neapolitan, his mother Padova. Her father, Girolamo, was one of Carlo's primary inspirations and natural teachers of Commedia dell'arte. Quote, my grandfather was Commedia. I would not have survived my childhood without him. He was a storyteller and an impersonator, a tremendous elocution and clever imitation. He could imitate birds, animals, or humans. So with an ear for dialects, including his mother's Padovan Hill dialect, Carlo eventually spoke French, Spanish, could read Greek and Latin, as well as play in the dialects of Bergamo, Tuscany, Naples, Venice, and more. His father, a military sharpshooter, <laughs> put his sword in Carlo's hand at the age of five. I find this a fascinating photo. It was in Carlo's effects, many of which I'm grateful to his family for having provided to us. Now if I could find that damn pen again, there it is. Okay, wait a minute, whoops. I said go to the next slide. No! <laughs> oh, the pen. I think that this is Carlo's dad, the tall guy with the mustache. But I find this an extraordinarily fascinating photograph for a look at how status operates in groups. <laughs> I mean, who is the focus of attention? <laughs> a little dude with a cigarette. <laughs> and I don't know Italian Army uniforms. I don't know what rank is. So I don't know if that guy has better, you know, 
guy to the right of me, which one? In the right, right or left one? That one? Yeah, that one. Yeah. 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 That was in his hand. In his hand. That one. Yeah. That, that is the arm. In the lighter color. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. So let me erase that. An arm has to be formed in the arm. The other arm is a brigade. That ends. And it's also a very nice hat. <laughs> As Giovanni points out, Italy at this time was under control of the fascists. And, uh, blah, 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 blah. so, his death put a sword in Carlo's hand at the age of five. Known as the Earthquake Kid, Carlo loved climbing trees and jumping from them. <laughs> he learned to run fast to escape beatings from his parents, <laughs> creating such strength in his legs that he was able to sprint 100 yards in 11 seconds competing against the best runner from the USA in 1945. His five years of army service commenced in 1939 while Italy was in control of the fascists. And in the last years of World War II during the German occupation, he joined the resistance. The dialects came in handy, he said. He was once caught by a band of German and Italian soldiers. Noting that some of them were Tuscan, he conversed with them in their dialect. They were convinced he was one of them and let him go. In 1944, Carlo discovered that he was an actor and a poet. His formal acquaintance with the history, characters, and atmosphere of the Commedia dell'arte began as a member of the Teatro Università Padova. He had briefly attended the University of Bologna, but did not return after the war, much more excited by the artistic and political atmosphere in Padova. He joined the Democratically Oriented Action Party, and in 1945 met Gianfranco de Bosio, director of theater at the University of Padua, which was one of the leading opponents of the city's fascist regime. Carlo took part in radio broadcasts from the Voice of Padua University. He was one of the two voices. He performed in reviews and sketches, and was one of the five-member nucleus of the Padua University players directed by de Bosio. These players, they were not all students. They were people who coalesced around this nucleus. Um, so it was a, a really mixed and incredible group. Until this time, Carlo had no knowledge of Commedia dell'arte. Quote, I didn't know I was doing Commedia because until I entered into this group, I didn't realize the importance of Commedia. Some of us went to Paris, came back and said, well, wait a minute, we have this tremendous tradition and we don't even know we have it. I was involved with poetry, with soccer, with silent movies as a kid, with watching my grandfather. And then all of a sudden, all these things came together at Padua University. It's like you pass in front of a church all the time and you never go into it. And people come from 6,000 miles away and say, here's the famous church. <laughs> and you say, what? And suddenly, you belong, you participate, you recognize. So it was de Bosio and his associate, Giuseppe Papafava, who went to Paris, first bringing back Marcel Marceau in 1947. And Carlo was <coughs> chosen to partner Marceau in Marceau's first Italian tour. Um, he was working with the bit, bit material at this time. And, um, it, and uh, Marceau was interested in comedia, is Carlo quoting, so he came to Padua because Padua was known as the origin. And he knew more about Commedia than we did. Marceau wanted to do a show. He'd just been doing the character of Bip for two months. And he chose me among the others to be his partner. We toured Italy in 1947. The next year, they came back with the car. And we began doing Commedia with him. Carlo became the Cox's assistant in his work with the Padua players. Quote, I was the only one of the actors who spoke French. <laughs> so Lecoq decided I was going to follow him. Every night I was taking him home and he was giving me notes about what he did that day in class and what he wanted to do the next day between 1948 and 1951. And Lecoq himself said, I came to Italy for three months and ended up staying eight years. Here's what he said about Carlo in 1956. The road to mine is long. After eight years in Italy, I have helped many actors, but produced few real minds and only one teacher, my assistant, Mazzoni. In 1948, 
sculptor and fellow Padovan, Pamleto Sartori, began teaching mass work to the players. When Carlo immigrated to America, it was with 10 Sartori masks that he began his, did I just like this? That he began his. <laughs> made for Carlo by Amleto, and this mask is sitting over here, and I think I and he would enjoy it if this were passed around, if people would like to touch it. And let's look at it, please. So I tried, once asked Sartori, I said, how do, you, how do you keep these things? And he said, you wear them. attend the EPJD, Education par le Dramatique, in Paris, a school started by Jean-Louis Barrault. Um, his work with Barrault, though brief, it only lasted about six months, was deeply affecting. As Commedia dell'arte became rediscovered, reinvented, renewed, and revitalized after World War II, the strongest support for Commedia as a living form was coming from France, from Mainz. Lecoq, Marceau, and Barreau, this tripod of influences would guide Carlo for the next 50 years, his knowledge and conception of Commedia forever inseparable from the idea of Mainz. Uh, he described this school, uh, somewhat like I think those of you who were at this school in the early years, it was chaotic. You didn't quite know what the program was going to be that day, and, but, but you were learning all the time because there was this incredible array of talents um, assembled around it, and the passion was so great at that time for that. Um, Carlo acted while at the Padua Players uh, for Eric Bentley, who directed for the Padua University Players the first Brecht play in Italy, The Exception and the Rule, in 1951. Bentley would later assist Carlo to establish himself in the U.S. as a teacher and performer. De Bozio also brought musician Jimmy Loverman Davis who the guy who wrote Lover Man, who participated, let's see, where's my little pan? Okay, so here's Jimmy Lover Man Davis, right? Sorry, Jimmy, to do that. And here's Carl. Well, I, I, I know, I know. <laughs>
sani da leggere. I sani da legare. I sani da legare. <laughs> which means a madhouse for the same. <laughs> um, company Parenti Poggerano, they were the first uh, to do post-war satirical reviews. And um, this was their second one. The first one was called A Finger in the Eye. And um, if you, there, this, there's a scene on YouTube which I did not have the technical chops to incorporate in here, but it's on YouTube under this title. You'll find it. And in the beginning, you see this tall platform here. Carlo is standing up there in the picture. That's him with the beard. He jumps down, lands, and announces the title of the show. So. The guy could jump. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, just a couple of more shots from that show. It looked like a lot of fun, like everyone was having a good time. How important that is. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, uh, four years later, a great leap. Uh, see, now I, I've lost this marvelous spot that in my writing. I'm going to go back. Uh, Carlos entrance with a jump from a high platform above the stage to announce the show's title. Four years later, after a great leap across the Atlantic to New York, <laughs> <laughs> another stage jump would determine his future. I'll get to that. Quote, I decided to have a studio, a laboratory, and to be realistic about working with what I learned from the talk in my towns and my background in Canada. The only place I could do it was in Rome. His classes drew mostly American actors. He says, I had Italian actors, but they were not very consistent. The Americans were dedicated and enthusiastic. I was impressive. So when they started to say, Carlo should go to New York. Well, I had a friend who wrote 75 letters to the United States, and 25 answered, come right over. So I said, stupid, why am I staying here in Rome to battle to become TV or commercial or non-commercial or having engagements or doing stunts involving risking my life? And so the letters from America inviting me, here's one of those ridiculous things, the mime and the model. <laughs> Got a couple more of these, they're great. surrounded by lively curiosity about the Italian tradition. 
because I believe an acquaintance with the art of these humble players to be fundamental to all who yearn for more style in the technically brilliant age of American realism, I have combined masks, costumes, and dialects of the most popular of the stock characters into a one-man sketch with commentary booked on the college circuit this year. Yes, I would most like to privately show it to people like you, for since these men were the inventors of the professional theater, they are really your ancestors. Mm -hmm. And because they are, most particularly mine, I hope I shall not betray them or you. RSVP to Vivian Masonia, Circle 5, 4468. Carlo designed the costumes and in Sartori's <coughs> mask, he played Dottore, Graffiello, Pantalone, Arlecchino, Capitano, and Pulcinella. Scaramouche he added as a link, plus an invisible Columbina. I did Scaramouche as a good <laughs> <laughs> I said that with no irony. Come on. <laughs> I did Scaramouche because he's a fencing master. A skirmisher is what it means. Hit and run, a disturbance, a gorilla. He's a bother, he's a flea. Even the elephant doesn't like a flea, right? That's the idea. A skirmish, a disturbance. I was inspired as much by Duchamp, a lot of the cock, and I invented this scenario from my own knowing of the tirades and the dialects in the Lhasa. It was Bentley's agent, Toby Cole, who booked the show across the country. Fall of 1958 was a turning point. He was cast as the cock, a non-speaking role, in the world premiere of Sean O'Casey's Cockadoodle Dandy, which premiered in Toronto, followed by an off-Broadway run in New York. Review quote about Carlo. Of all the hearty, outspoken company, there is one other who deserves special mention. Carlo Mazzoni impersonates the role with dash and spirit, a solid symbol of the production's solid symbolism. That's from the Globe and Mail, Toronto. Um, in November, the production opened at the Carnegie Hall Playhouse in New York, directed by Philip Burton and starring Will Gear. <coughs> Carlo's role was physically very demanding. He says, I was practicing. Every night I would warm up because I had one difficult thing. I would jump into the audience from a dark, room 12 feet in the air, and crow, cock a doodle dandy! <laughs> I had not much space to land. Boom! I had to do it in the dark, or it would spoil the whole thing. I was scared every night, so I had to warm up as if I was in a competition. The warm up was real athletic stuff, and one night I'm jumping downstairs in Carnegie Hall. Under the hall, they built a little theater, and I'm jumping on the grids. I didn't realize it was old-fashioned ironwork, probably defective or rusty or whatever, but boom! I went two stories down to the basement. I was wounded, but luckily I was survivor. <laughs> In his knees, both of them, my cartilages were injured. Of course I sued Carnegie Hall. <laughs> <laughs> and of course I still did the show anyway. Sitting there in the dark, I went, call, 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 and I finished the show. The doctor said, you have a choice. Operation, you could be better. Operation, you could be worse. Or you can lecture, comedian, so on. Well, I come from a town of surgeons, and the surgeons, they said, please, if you can avoid, avoid. Uh, so Carlo turned primarily to teaching and to demonstrations. This is uh, an ad mock-up for classes he was giving at a theater school in New York at the time, the Kubi Nan School. Mine was big in those days in New York. There was a lot of real interest there. So he uh, toured six characters in another two years, revealing to America what the traditional stock characters looked like, talked like, and moved like. On his 1959 West Coast tour, um, another seed was planted with the San Francisco Mime Troupe, which began performing Comedia that year. Founder R.G. Davis, a former student of DeClue, recalled, first we read all the books in English on Comedia we could find, plays and histories, we looked at pictures. Fortunately, Carlo Mazzoni came through San Francisco and spent a week with me talking about Comedia. On Bentley's recommendation, Carlo was engaged in 1958 for two seasons with the Stratford Festival to teach the actors, among them actress Julie Harris. Um, he was asked to join the new Canadian Center for Theatre Arts, directed by Thomas Thomas, a precursor to the National Theatre School of Canada. He continued teaching and performing in New York, promoting the new natural French method of Dr. Cock. Um, I want to read you something briefly. This is an ad for Carlo's first mime studio um, called What is Modern Mime? 
pretty amazing that it was at 58 West 57th Street. I don't know if you know what that address is, but I mean, where 58 West 57th Street would be. But Vivian was financing this. Is that for me, my agent? <laughs> yeah, you didn't get the job done. Damn it! <laughs> You're looking for a man. <laughs>
gathering dozens of support letters from theater figures like Joseph Kopp, John Gassner, and Walter Kerr, but Carlo never got the foundation support he needed to mount the exhibition. <coughs> but it was also <coughs> introduced Carlo to his first American partner, Hubby Burgess. Um, blah, blah, I'm gonna skip some of this. La, la, la. Uh, Carlo also taught at Brandeis University, where one of the productions he coached said, much lauded director Clementi, once Marcel, Marceau's sign holder, trained the actors to move <laughs> with a precision and a style spectacular and never before achieved on the Brandeis stage. So just to say that so much of what Carlo was bringing here at that time was absolutely new, unseen. For us, it's pretty commonplace in our world and becoming much more so in the larger world, but it was kind of revelatory then. In 1965, he was hired to coach the acting company at the new repertory theater of Lincoln Center and performed in their inaugural production of Danton's Death. Um, Ted Hoffman brought him to NYU, where he met Hubby, worked, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, in 19, okay, sorry, I'm ripping ahead. This is Carlo at ACT, where Jane and Carlo moved after they were married in 1968. Um, wanted to get away from the East Coast. He was increasingly frustrated where theater training was dominated by the American method, so hired by founder, artistic director, William Ball, to teach the actors, he and Jane moved to the West Coast. Ball was part of a new movement toward regional repertory companies, toward integrating mime, movement, mass, and combat training in actor training, just as Saint Denis had programmed for the Juilliard School. <coughs> At ACT, Carlo encountered the FM Alexander technique and British style voice training. As he developed his own pedagogy and finally opened his own school in Blue Lake, he included them in his curriculum along with mime, aikido, and mask, using his own version of the neutral mask, the <coughs> physical mask made by Umberto. So. <laughs> Carlo Maggie was 1968. Uh, I believe it was 1972, if I had that right, Jane, that y'all moved out to the West Coast to work at ACT. And, no. wrong, okay? We moved out in 1968. Oh, then you were married in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> so, to the Redwoods.
festival up and running. Um, and they, they became new pioneers. I mean, that's essentially why I came to Humboldt also, is to get, get out of the city. We all thought the revolution was going to come. <laughs> <laughs>
teaching with us in the beginning was Abner, who came out in January of 1975. We shared a house in Arcata, and um, then he got a contract which led to his Broadway, off-Broadway, and international successes. But he said, to Jacques Lecoq, who taught me everything I know, to Carlo Mazzoni Clemente, who taught me everything else. <laughs> and John has a great anecdote. I think it's in your film, is it not, about how Carlo was upset by that. What do you mean? It was <laughs> crazy if it didn't, but it was about the things you don't know are more important than the things you know. So here we are in Blue Lake with a company and a school. Um, hang on, I just have to go to my... Uh, mm, no, okay. Hang on. Uh, anybody need to stretch? <laughs> um, at the end of the 1976 school year, things felt a bit apart here. Uh, Jane said, I've had it. I've had it with you, I've had it with Del Arte. I'm, I don't know what she, how she said it. I'm sure it was more dramatic and funny. But, um, the board of directors quit. College of the Redwoods said, we don't want your festival anymore. Get out of here. Um, and um, myself and John Paul Cook, who was another Lecoq grad teaching at that time, um, we were left with a building, maybe seven students coming in, no money, <coughs> except this little grant. This, the second part of this little grant that Jane had cleverly got was in the bank. But the grant was to tour the production that was supposed to have been already made. <laughs> which hadn't been made. So, uh, John Paul and I and Carlo stood in and we said, what do we do? I said, okay, let's form a new company. Let's take this money, make a show, and tour it on this money. We'll all work for nothing until we can get it going. Um, and that was the genesis of the present Del Arte company. And so we took this money. Carlo had this very extraordinary idea that the mythological spirit figures of Native American religion, cosmology, mythology, were very akin to some of the Commedia characters. So um, he wanted to do a piece based on that. So the piece that he, such a typical Carlo title, so great yet so difficult to understand. Arlecchino and the Force of Credulity. Now I know exactly what that means. But at the time, I'm scratching my head. That's not going to look good on a poster. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> so um, when we toured the production, and we commissioned uh, J.L. Weissman, who had been with the Mime Troupe, and who had um, come up to work at Kuala Lumpur Festival, um, and was a director, we commissioned him to write the play. And he chose Joan Holden, also of the Mime Troupe, and Steve Most to write this play with him. And it's, um, uh, we toured it as the Loon's Rage, figures that we weren't in it, but just the show. And um, in that, we hired Michael Fields, who's now our producing artistic director, to come and work with us in the new company. This is here just because I think it's, uh, there's very few pictures of Carlo and he looks this sad. Uh, and I don't even know if it's from this period, but for me, the years after the loss of the festival, the divorce, and a huge schism within the company um, were not easy for Carlo. So one of the things that happened was that he entered into a pilgrim phase. And he began a wandering period where he went Mexico, he went to Denmark, and met up with a student from the class of 1976, a very wonderful man. Would you mind leaving that door open? I think we could use some air. I certainly could, thank you. Um, Ole Brecki, who had found a school in Stockholm and was moving to Denmark, and he considers Carlo the co-founder of his school, the Comedia School, and um, invited him to work there. Here's a picture of Carlo with a copy. This is not the original Metaphysical Mass. There's one with a case in the hall, uh, working at Oli's school. And they had an extraordinary friendship, bond. And um, I just saw Oli in Denmark a month ago. 
Improvviso. 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 E non ho. Carlo, il lato come per l'altro, because it was the source of the Italian theater. Spontaneous mass, that was what made you up. We were masked, we were slapstick, we do all kinds of routines, and you can see a ball, we do red skeleton, we do Buster Keaton, and you can see Kramer do it as he comes to the door. The scripts for Warren Hardy are just scenarios, just like the Navy Guard. When they're pushing the piano up the stairs, so improvised. That's what makes it so funny. While I went in the Probably car, Charles was mad at her face offense. I didn't understand anything he was saying. I found that the best way to deal with Carlo was just to watch him. It was only years later that I came to understand just how important Carlo was and is to my very being as an artist. He presented me for the first time in Italy. He was for me such a good friend. He came here, claimed himself as an authority, and made his art to build a legend around himself. Anytime you're on the line, remember you are a court. Second city crown, starting line with the top of the tree. Tutu Soleil is one of the great crowning uh, flowers of this music that started in the late 40s. It truly bloomed in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Flipping on a banana tree is all I have. Why do people do that? Why do we laugh? Man, ah.
invited Carla to teach at the Hartford stage in 1990, I'm not even going to write it, six, thank you, to coach the actors on Sermon of Two Masters. He did workshops with them. They thought he was nuts. They wanted quick answers. It was like going to a Zen master and saying, just give, give, me, give me the answer, please. And then we'll go off the road. But the answers are never easy. I thought he was terrific. Um, so he's someone, you know, working in the mainstream theater who really got Carlo. <coughs> Carlo's vision of a company school, school company, alive for 40 years. Was the contribution that I think has been carried on is the development of the American stock characters. And some people say, oh, they don't do Comedia out there. Um, and, um, but Comedia, as Carlo knew it, was about working with where you are. Theater of place, he never used those words. Um, we used them, I think, first probably around 1976. But that American stock characters, the hard-boiled detective, uh, when we toured this show, Donald Forrest at Deep Drop, myself at Scar Tissue, uh, contemporary stock characters. Um, and as comedians here to play top, to play black level and ensemble, the audience recognized immediately. Here we did the American working class stock characters mm -hmm. in a play called Slapstick, using all the great vaudeville routines that we could think of and could do at the time that we did this piece in 1980. <clears throat> we have done our homage to Goldoni. This is La Bottega de Cafe in um, 2005. That's Donald as Don Marzio, me in the pants role over there as Ridolfo. Daniel Stein as the Count and Amelia. Amelia, <coughs> Amelia, are you in the room, my dear? Not this morning, okay. Uh, as, and Laura Munoz, who choreographed Mary Jane, uh, performing as Platida. And Stephen Bisher, are you in the room, Stephen? Okay. Uh, 2005, and this beautiful set designed by an Italian artist who worked with us for seven years, Giulio Cevere Caron. Uh, he and I co-directed and co-wrote a piece based on Casanova's memoirs. Um, this is the lovely Amelia, again, she's not here, when the company paired with the Baroque Magnificat Ensemble of San Francisco in um, Monte Parnasso, which is a madrigal, really, and um, it's um, uh, Stephen, Joe Diefenbacher, uh, both all Del Arte grads. Joe became the director of the San Francisco Climate Conservatory and just quit that job. Here is the ensemble. They were wonderful. It's a, and it was done in this gorgeous church. <coughs> uh, three actors playing many roles. Each Comedia, uh, Stephen and Joe. I would like to show you this piece because it is one of my absolute favorite pieces from the Del Arte company. Um, performance anxiety. I have to set the stage just a little bit. In 1981, the State Office of Family Planning commissioned us to do a piece about men's responsibility in birth control. There were certain things we couldn't mention. <laughs> <laughs> and at the time, no one was talking about HIV. So that was not on the table at all, so to speak. And um, uh, in this play, we, just, we have never done a traditional comedia style piece before this time. So we, our agent was saying, you've got to do comedia. Your name is Del Arte. But we said, it doesn't mean that. Do it. So we <laughs> created a comedia company who worked in a dinner theater in New Jersey, which there are many. <laughs> used to be then. Um, the leading lady, me, is having an affair with the young actor who's playing Arlecchino, and he's not very good. Um, I'm married to the capo of the company, played by Michael. Um, the young man, uh, while we were on tour, uh, impregnated a young woman. He gets a phone call saying he's got to leave. Um, he doesn't know what to do. He tells the couple that this has happened. Um, they fire him. She wants nothing more to do with him because he cheated on her even though she was in an adulterous relationship with him. In a fit of sadness, he hangs himself from the flies at the end of Act 1. Act 2 takes place in his mind in the moments before he is dying. And he has a comedian nightmare based on the scenario that they were playing before, in which uh, Pantalone tells his servant, Arlecchino, to dress up like a woman, go try to ingratiate himself, herself with uh, Isabella so that Pantalone can come and with flowers and the ground will be prepared. So this is the, um, the nightmare.
and it'd be like listening to a symphony with earmuffs. So
done in comedy this wonderful show called C3, The Clown Show. No! Produced here in 2014 with, uh, created and performed by Joe Crinky, Lauren Wilson, Stephanie Thompson. Uh, inverted Alba, a piece uh, based on the writings of Garcia Lorca, including his puppet play, in which I played Don Cristobal, Laura Mendoza, Corey Pratt. Another American stock character, the country western singer, played by Michael Fields with hair extensions and uh, <coughs> wild heart. Uh, another stock character, Mary Jane, um, that we just finished three years of running, and Mary Jane has been invited to be the Grand Marshal in the Annie and Mary Day Parade this year. Which means she's a recognizable stock character. I've had two young women come up to me and say, we're preparing our Mary Jane costumes for Halloween. <laughs> The stage must remain a dangerous place. The actor poet being a member of an ensemble, a community of theater makers, must be imaginative and skilled in manifesting all aspects of the theatrical world, holding tenaciously to the belief that the world's manifest before the audience need not be representative nor indicative of the incident of our time. The actor poet must be the diviner of the walk about. Seers and dwellers capable of manifesting the other, no longer content to reflect reality, but who invent, imagine stories capable of speaking through time with a voice that bears witness to the world that we know. It is the fire of inspiration, the tenacious imaginative region the rigorous invention, the disciplined pursuit of clarity that manifests poetic, prophetic epics, capable of igniting a flame, illumination for a path to the future. The question then, who will step into this charged space with the heart to discover, to find in one's self the other, the treacherous deceiver, the noble, the valiant, how to strike the bell that is not there, to sound the alarm, to play the pipe, to pluck the unseen strings and cause sound, to be resonant conduit of an impulse, a tone that would remain otherwise inaudible. Of this business, 
Yeah. Yeah. Like the surface where the actors are doing something, manifesting a world, not just imitating reality. There must be something else.
where some of this stuff came from when I start. His first wife kept very great archives for the early years. Okay, Arnie's at home. Well, this is a, a tough act to follow, of course. Um, hi, Jim. Hi, hi Arnie. Hi. This, uh, uh, what you've done is so much more than Carl ever achieved. He was not a happy man. I was 19 when I met him, and I lived through all of this, and saw it all, and had fights with him, and had to escape him, and, and we were intimate. <laughs> we beat in the same pot at the same time. And he said, now we are friends. <laughs> <laughs> we, had <just> driven, <laughs> we had just driven back from New York, and we both had to take a pee, and he said, come on, we pee together. And that is a sign of friendship, <laughs> of course. What you've achieved here is such an honor, and his life will go on. The mask is here. Everything is here, and the continuation is a miracle. I don't know how you guys did it, how you can live in the woods all these years. <laughs> I, I get nervous if I don't see cement every half hour. I mean, it's, just, it's really extraordinary. I mean, I was the first, I was the first, I was the luckiest, and, and, and I lived with him and followed him. Oh, there's a phrase, if you sit at the feet of the rabbi and nibble the crumbs that fall from his beard, that's how you learn. And that's what we had to do, right? We had to nibble. He was not a happy man. Uh, I, I lived with him for so long, and you had a, and Jane did an incredible job. And Val, is Val here? No. No, not now. I hope to see him here. <laughs> I mean, I, I, uh, it, it's a mitzvah. If anybody can learn a mitzvah, this whole thing is a mitzvah, a blessing for all of you that never met him. How many of us have met him, and how many of us here? What well, you said last night that that people here had not met him, and so you missed. But, but this is now we we met him. Good Lord, I'm so happy to be here. Yeah. And I'll talk to you all. I have a car. Now are you doing a workshop? And uh, uh, it, well, wait, I have one more thing to say. I had to say, wait, 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 Carlos spoke. He said, they don't get it. He said that to me when the, when the, when the, when the rift came. And I came back and I held the, the hands together and I said, you guys have got to be together. And he said, they don't get it. And I could make a vulgarity. I'll tell you at the, in the lunch. You know the vulgarity? He said, close is not good enough. Mm. <laughs> but now you've got it. That comedian that was there. Did he see that? Had he seen that? Did he ever see the routine that you did with Michael? No? I honestly don't. I don't know. I, if he had seen that, he would have said, you got it. Believe me, I know. Those of us that got it, you got it. That was what I said, you've got to have a finish, man. I said, you, I don't, what's it going to be? Are there three? Well, one is good. Two is good. Three? How many comes in three? But that's the finish. <laughs> you take the talent, that he has, and, and, and the teamwork was just superb. So that's what I can say. I'll tell you the vulgarity, but should I say it now? Yeah. 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 I think you can, Lucy Johnson. Did you, you, <laughs> he said, close is not good enough. He said, the asshole is one inch from the fuck hole. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
and supporting his work. And she came uh, when we had the memorial. Uh, I always had this fancy. Vivian was a very wealthy woman. And I think her family owned the whole New Jersey side <laughs> of, the, of, of the Hudson River. Um, but uh, I always had this fantasy that since they did not have children and she was interested in his work, that perhaps uh, she would be the bequest or a legacy that would make Joan's book possible or something. And in one of those sort of sad, strange stories um, where Comedia becomes melodrama, uh, Vivian died penniless uh, about uh, two years ago, I guess. And I knew that because I began, I, I was contacted by a cousin of hers, whom I never heard of, who wanted to know uh, if I could tell her the date that Carlo was married to her and when they were divorced, because they needed proof of that for her to apply for state assistance. Now, this is a woman who lived in the penthouse of the Gramercy Park Hotel, who, as Arnie knows, because oh, yes, he lives
but it was reinvented after World War II. It was, it was being explored yeah. in the 20s, and, and uh, yeah. uh, what's his name? Uh, Satori. No, I was thinking of the, the Mask, the magazine from, uh, anyway, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but the idea that Carlo was reinventing Commedia, reinventing himself, you know, you have certain ways of calling his exercises, you do, Ole does, Hubby does, uh, and they're all a little different because he kept changing and evolving. Mm -hmm. And that's what you should take from this school. You too should take it, reinvent it, remake it. Carl always said, steal a bit, make it your own. <laughs> right? So keep doing that. And thank you for doing that. So Commedia has been a way to own together, to hold together polarities and wounds and scars that are very deep. So Carlo came here uh, after the war and he saw things. You have to remember that we had war in our homeland. So Commedia, that re 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 renewal of Commedia was done by a generation of men that had gone through the war and there was this desire of just standing after this terrible event, but also uh, there was blood around, a lot. So I, I really want to say this, like there's this tragedy of the last day also, and we love the 51% of comedy because it's a great way to hold the things that we don't understand, but they're also very, ah, it's like there's a oof in it. So uh, yes, there's a oom in the thing. And, uh, and I love that you here have the, the thing of the theater of a place, because place means land, the land means also connection with yeah, the, the, right. the wounds of the land. Right. And comedy That's can right. say something about it. That's right. And uh, not to mention that here we are also in a place of, of lots of wounds in the past. The new world yeah. is also full of wounds. That's right. And uh, there's a lot of great stuff in it. And I really want to do this again. You will say, Tomega de Marte, et qui?